monster. It's an odd word, considering my grandmother is your great-grandmother, and this has always been a family story. But to my eye, the demigod is a more dangerous creature. Disruptive, violent. If I exist for anything, it is to stand in the way of monsters. Thank you. All the way from Providence, Rhode Island, welcome to the Percy Jackson Prophecy. It's a podcast dedicated to the Percy Jackson book series and show on Disney+. Plus. So let's hold fast and brave the storm. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm your host, Mary Larson. My name is Reese, and I will be your co-host for today. That's right. You're always my co-host, buddy. And I got to say, I absolutely love having you as my co-host. You know, you and I have talked about this before. Your dad, Blake, and I have been podcasting since you weren't even one. You've grown up having a family of podcasters. Podcasting is also a family affair, just like this show is. Just like how Echidna is related somehow to to these demigods. So I loved that bit and that clip because I wanted to share with it. And also to share the idea that sometimes we need to see things from a different perspective. You know, Echidna is standing there saying, monster, you know... I think you guys are the monsters. I think you're very disruptive. And when we last episode, we got to hear from which monster in the last episode? Um, in episode three. Okay, episode three. Medusa. Medusa. And did she think of herself as a monster? No. No, she didn't at all. So I really liked that Echidna is challenging us, the viewers, to think who really is the monster and what makes a monster. So we're going to delve into that. On that note, let's get into the show. Reese, let's hear what is the episode title for episode four. I plunge to my death. I plunge to my death. Oh, goodness. And in this episode, the heroes search for a refuge in St. Louis and uh, come face to face with a mother of all monsters who and we now know as Echidna. And one of those monsters is the... Chimera. So Chimera. So I'm going to have you tell us all about those things in a little bit. But first, it's time for Dad's details. We have my husband and your dad, Blake, who is here. And one of the reasons that we wanted to include Dad's details in these podcasts is to teach us some of the things about how this show is made to be. Um, the people who made it possible. We enjoy watching it. We enjoy listening to it. But there's hundreds of people who made this episode in and of itself possible. So, Blake, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. I'm Hello. glad to be back once more. Of course, this episode is once again directed by Anders Engstrom. You should know that name if you listen to this podcast because he directed the last episode. And it was written by the creator and showrunner of this show, Jonathan E. Steinberg, as well as another writer, Joe Tratch. Now, Joe Tratch is somewhat of an interesting writer in that he wrote for the show A Series of Unfortunate Events on Netflix. If you remember that show, it came out, I would say, maybe three or four years ago. And then, Mary, he also created the show that you watched, I think, uh, not too long ago, Dash and Lily on yes. Netflix. Yes, he was the, nice. He was the creator and showrunner of that show. I as thoroughly well. enjoyed that show. And, uh, you know, I think that one of the... One of the, I think this episode is has both good and bad things uh, to show for itself. First, uh, I will say what my bad is. I know we have a tradition of GBG, uh, but I do want to say that I enjoyed this episode. I think one of the things that it suffers from is that it often tells you, I think, that you have to be scared uh, of Echidna instead of showing you that you should be scared of Echidna herself. Um but I think the thing that it does fantastic is that it 
uh, abides by a Mary and Blake commandment, Mary. And do, you, do you know which commandment I'm talking about? I don't know. There's many of there them. There are many Mary and Blake Including media commandments. Including Blake shall not sing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Blake shall not uh, sing. For those of you who are new to the to Mary and Blake media, we have a bunch of Mary and Blake media commandments. Uh, th- you know, ideas or tenets that a show should or a movie should abide by at all times. And in this particular case, Mary, the commandment is... Book ending. Oh, that might be your favorite one. Ooh, it, it's close. Book ending is so important because what it does is that it sh- a, a natural book end is uh, it, the show or movie begins one way and it shows you or uh, unveils to you maybe a piece of dialogue or a, um, a, a, a bit of direction or maybe even uh, a scene. Uh, with some imagery, it starts that way, and that at the end of the movie or at the end of the episode, it shows you the same scene or the same dialogue, but in a different context. And in this case, uh, we begin with Percy uh, at the pool and learning to swim with his mother and how she it, he reminds her to just breathe. It's okay. Don't worry. And at the end of the episode, after Poseidon saves him from his plunging death, uh, he remembers the same exact line, just breathe. And that helps uh, give us the, uh, the idea, or at least present to us the idea, that Percy can actually breathe underwater. So a very, very important, important uh, bit of bookending to not only highlight the character, but something uh, uh, of a plot device, which is allowing the character to breathe underwater. Something, you, something that helps expand and enlighten that character. Uh, really good stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you. And how do you feel about the book ends, Reese, that, that Dad was talking about? I have no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I was so trailing Blake, away. <laughs> how would you explain it to our 10-year-old son? Okay, so... Let's say, Reese, I said something to you like, blue is the best color. No, it's no, red. We're but just let's pretending. just say that blue is the best color. Okay. And throughout the whole movie, or throughout the whole show, or throughout our whole conversation, I kept showing you blue, 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 blue. And then at the end of our conversation, at the end of our uh, movie or show, all of a sudden, let's say... Oh, I get it. Let's all of a sudden say the the color that I show you is pink. What? But I still say blue is the best color. Maybe it shows you that there is a growth from, from you or from me. It highlights the idea that may I started one way and I ended another way, but I'm showing it to you in a different manner. I'll give you another example. So you know how you've been practicing writing essays in school and you have Mm -hmm. a thesis statement and then you have a conclusion statement and usually they need to be pretty similar, right? Kind of, but I'm not doing essays much. Okay, but you know what I'm talking about, right? You were learning about essays last year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this episode, it begins with Percy telling his mom to do what? Breeze. And what is the water spirit telling Percy to do at the end of this episode? Just breathe so that is called a book in when we're bringing something in the beginning and then something in the end that are kind of very similar and they kind of tie it up with a new a, a, a nice little bow at the end but it has that continuity so having people talk about just breathing is uh, is a bookend it's an example of a bookend here and those kind of things and sometimes dad really excited and sometimes it helps show growth it helps show like how percy changed he was scared right he was scared that he was underwater and he couldn't breathe. And then the water spirit showed up and said, just breathe. It was telling him to do the same exact thing that his mother told him. And that showed the growth that Percy has that he's able to breathe underwater. Oh, and that's what bookending means. Something in the beginning, something in the end. <laughs> Similar, but growth, hopefully, in between. Well, thank you so much, Blake. You're welcome. For heading on over. And now, buddy, it is time for our Trident rating. So we rate each episode on a scale of one to five. One being the worst, like falling from the St. Louis Arch. And five being the best, hmm, what was like the best in this episode? I don't know, being Sur- rescued and surviving Sur- the fall? <laughs> no, <laughs> right? um, surviving underwater. Yeah, learning you can breathe underwater. That's not too shabby. So my Trident rating for this episode is a 4.8 
which is just a tenth of a hair less than last episode. I, I actually enjoyed the last episode just a smidge better, but I still really, really enjoyed this episode. Reese, what is your rating for the Trident rating for this episode? Four tenths under from five. I'm like 4.6. It ended too short. It, it was too short for you. Yeah. I would agree. Why, with why didn't they kill Chimera? That is so bad. I'm like, well, where do you kill Chimera? Why do you kill Chimera? Kill it. Now, well, now we're going to have to wait and see if he's able to uh, get rid of this monster. Okay, GBGs, our goods, our bads, our greats. My good in this episode is kind of like what Dad was saying about bookends, but mine's different. You ready for this? Uh -huh. In the beginning of the episode, after we see Percy swimming with his mom, and he wakes up from a nightmare, but it's still, well, in the nightmare, it's still very young Percy. And he's hearing the voice from that cloaked person who has a source of light. And they're saying, oh, she is coming. Then in the very end of the episode, there's another cloaked figure who is telling Percy to breathe. But they look so similar. They're both, when, when we saw it on the shot, Percy was in the left corner and the cloaked figure in the scary cloaked male figure sound was, was in the upper right hand corner. And then in the end, when Percy's underwater, he's in the bottom left hand corner of the screen. And yet that water naiad, that water spirit is in the upper right hand corner with kind of a glowing light. So they looked very similar. One was scary. One seemed calming. And I just thought that that was really neat because to me, having not read the series, they look like the same person. Just one's in the desert and one's in the water and one's good and one seems to be bad. One's male, but, one but, female. Yep, yeah, one has a male voice, one has a female voice. So it's just very interesting to me. My bad, how do the kids have so much money? Okay, because let's be real. They left from New York City. Percy had 200 United States dollars and uh, some drachmas. I'm wondering, like, did they all get $200? I don't know how these kids are able to get on, uh, the, have taxi rides. That in and of itself in New York City would have cost $200. Then they're on a train and they get all the way to St. Louis. Then they have money to get up into the St. Louis Arch. Um, and they're not even halfway across the country fully yet. So I don't know how they are fiscally going to make it all the way. I don't even know. And then the other thing that is bad for me is to me, someone who doesn't know a lot about ancient Greek myths, I don't know who Chimera is, and I'm learning who Echidna is in this episode, but Grover and and uh, Annabeth and even Percy at times are like, oh, that's the Chimera, that's Medusa. And for people who've never studied the Greek myths before, they may be a little lost, so I figured we're gonna we're gonna help them in this episode. The Greek mythology um, dictionary is then, me. Yeah, exactly. And then my great is the CGI, the computer graphics and animation, particularly with the camera, was so good in this episode. And when I did the fire thing, the, like a rough flared out and yes. in the fire. Oh my god! I'm like, did you use real fire for that? Did someone use a flamethrower? They might have. So when they do work like that, some of it is realistic and some of it is computer generated. Uh, even like when Percy's falling from the arch and we get that spinning look and you were asking me, is this spinning look of falling, is this all computer generated? And I said, I don't know. Maybe they had a drone fall to capture, you know, what that looked like below. Maybe this was computer generated. Um, but no matter what, when you have to ask that question, when you have to say, was this real or was this computer? That's when you know that they've done a great job because you can't tell in between. Buddy, what are your GBGs? So my good is that what the heck? Percy and Arthur Grover use $200 or less to get sleeping cabins in the train? <laughs> Oh my God, what you, the heck? I remember when you saw this, you were like, wait a minute, people can sleep on trains? There's actual beds because you've never been on a sleeper train. We've only gone on, on very train. short train rides and you've been on a plane. But yeah, we've never been on a train that had sleeper cabins. And when Reese asked me, you know, is this real? Does this happen? I'm like, yeah. A lot of people do. They sleep on trains. And you I were am pumped. jealous. Yeah, you, you said like, this looks like a really cool sleepover. What was your bad for the episode? That Percy got stung and poisoned by Chimera. Oh. What the heck? That is a bummer way to go. That is a real bummer way to go. Not the way I'd like to be on my vacation. So you're like just walking on the street and then you see this lady like, and then she opens this, then it opens all by itself and out comes this tail that should not fit. And, <laughs> and you get spiked. It's like a bee sting. And then... About 10 minutes later, you start feeling yourself dying. Really, really sick. In okay. the, but in the myth, Chimera has a... Well, no, you're going to tell me about the myth Chimera in just a little moment, okay? Because that's what I'm talking about. You know so much about these myths. What's your great for this episode? 
Percy survives a fall of 630 feet. What, what, what? He survives oh that God. fall. Sometimes, I'll tell you a, a sad fact. Some pe- times when people fall from really high heights, Splat. they actually uh, die of a heart attack before they hit the ground because they're so scared. It like stops their heart. So I'm really glad but that survived, mm-hmm. that he survived the fall, that the water came to save him. And from he did Poseidon. not land on concrete. Also, yes, that would have been really, really I tell bad. what happens if you land right, on concrete. Nope, don't want to hear about that because it's going to be like a squishy banana, just like Grover said. <laughs> so we're going to take a quick moment to tell you about a brand new sponsor that we have here on the Percy Jackson Prophecy. D&D Adventure Club is our new sponsor. It's a monthly subscription of Dungeons and Draggers Adventures built for beginners. It's amazing stories written and designed for kids, families, and honestly, anyone interested in starting a game of D&D. A new adventure arrives in your mailbox every single month. So here's what's cool about it. They streamlined the rules, make they uh, have beautiful designs, pre-built characters, and this really allows anyone to pick up the game and start telling stories as soon as they get it. Now, we have been fortunate enough to get some of these Dungeons and Dragons, the D&D Adventure Club stories, and this has made me a parent much more confident that I can play Dungeons and Dragons. Reese started to get interested in the game just a little while ago, and it was really overwhelming for me, but also I didn't necessarily find all of the pre-made games um, or even the pickup games that you can get involved with in the uh, in the community, I didn't find them appropriate all the time for my 10 year old. So, so now I would love your perspective, buddy, quickly on the D&D Adventure Club, because we do have um, a coupon code at checkout if you want to try it out. The coupon code is Mary. So my name, M-A-R-Y 20, the number two zero. So Mary 20 at checkout to save 20 percent. And just a quick thing, Reese, give me uh, one you know, one or two sentences about why you like D and D Adventure Club. D and D Adventure Club is such a perfect way for beginners of D and D, and it starts off for people like, oh my god, how are you gonna learn D and D? And then they buy this and like, oh my god, this makes everything so simple. So D and D Adventure Club is not only just having fun; it helps people learn how to play games that are meant for older people. So it all started when these two parents had a kid who want who got interested in D and D, but it was not appropriate enough for their kid. Yeah. And now it's all over the place. It is. And there's gorgeous illustrations. So we're really excited for this new sponsor. Once again, D&D Adventure Club. Use the coupon code MARY20 at checkout. And you are going to be able to check it on out as we've been having a lot of fun. All right, buddy. On that note, let's dive into a couple of different things. Before we talk about what happened in this episode, I need to tap into your knowledge. We understand Echidna is the mother of monsters. And so that part kind of gets explained. But I don't understand who Chimera is, what Chimera is, aside from the fact that it's the magic of the mist was able to make it look small. We saw that little fluffy dog walking it's down the train. It's a chihuahua. <laughs> like a little fluffy, poofy, little poofy Pomeranian or something walking down. And it's so actually to other people, a humongous lion thing with horns. Yeah. So what is the Chimera? The Chimera is a Greek myth whose parents are actually Echidna and... Typhon, the father of monsters. Ooh. Typhon is the most craziest creature you could ever imagine. He was the son of Gaia and the brother of the Titans, but we gotta skip over that. Okay. So it's he a- is much bigger and much more scarier than the Titans. He um found somehow found a kid attractive and a kid that thought he well, was attractive too. So the chimera wait, hold on. You're getting stories a little bit. Okay, mixed let's right just now. get off there. <laughs> a lion so the chimera the chim- is a lion with a goat head in the middle of its back, but oh, people also think it's the goat body and has a snake for a tail in, in the myth, but actually he in the in this show he has rams he has a goat's horns mm-hmm. a lion's body a lion and a tiger head and no snake tail but poison tail yeah yeah so they took um some extra liberties they got to kind of make their own version of a chimera a little bit as you said it looks more like a tiger than a lion but to me it still looks like a big old feline cat that's fire breathing 
goat horns, some kind of crazy poisonous tail, and it is a child of a kidnap. And also, now, its tail kind of had this snake. Um, mm-hmm. Do you know the snake that's kind of black, yellow, and red at the same time, like corn snake? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it, it kind of looked like a corn snake with its head facing the chimera's rear end, but not going out <laughs> the, the back of the tail. Yeah. But, yeah, just think of a corn snake whose head is in a chimera's butt and okay. with spikes on its back. Now, another thing that gets brought up in this episode that I just wanted to delve into is the word impertinence. So Percy and Annabelle bring up impertinence when they are shipping off Medusa's head. And then, of course, here they are in the St. Louis Arch and... Athena will not help them out because of Annabeth's impertinence. So I just wanted to, well, Annabeth said because she went along with it that, that Athena saw it as impertinence as well, that Annabeth didn't stop him. And impertinence, for those of you who don't know, um, is a lack of respect. It is rudeness. So that is what impertinence means. It means that that person is being rude. They are being disrespectful. And that is why... Annabeth's mother, Athena, decides to let Chimera and Echidna into this sacred refuge because normally monsters are not allowed into temples. But Athena was like, man, my daughter was rude. Sure. Go ahead, Echidna. Go Go have a party. Go Go have have a meat buffet. Oh, my goodness gracious. Well, in the beginning of the episode, talking about another mother. Sally Jackson is there and she's doing some lessons with little, little wee, um, Percy, little Percy, a little lad. lad. And I loved seeing Sally again. How did it feel when you saw Sally in the beginning of this episode? Shocked. I didn't hear that in the book. I just didn't know. And uh, anyway. And do you know what this is called when they show us something from the past in I an don't episode? Know. I know. It's called a flashback. Oh, yeah. A flashback. Oh, yeah, a flashback. I so we see, that. and we know it's younger Percy. And so that helps us know that this isn't current time Sally Jackson. And why do you think she's so... She, she looks a little frustrated. Um, Percy is not wanting to swim. He's like, no, no, no. Just like me when I didn't want to eat pizza when I was young. <laughs> and now you love it, of course. Thank goodness. And now Percy's going to love being in the water, I assume, as well. So his mom is ta- telling him, come on, we've been waiting for 15 minutes. She looks around. Some of the other parents are looking at her with kind of a an odd look in their eyes. Like, wow, why is this mom having such a hard time? And she tells Percy, you need to learn how to do this. I won't always be there with you. I won't always be there to help save you. And this is something that can can even save your life. This is so important. And she's getting frustrated, but she's also scared because she doesn't know. You know, I'll, I'll be real with you, Reese. This is a parent's worst fear is their child getting hurt or possibly dying. And they're not there to be able to save them. And, you know, Percy is is about to die in this episode later on. And thank goodness his dad is able to save him. My goodness gracious. Then we go and we have that nightmare kind of scene with young Percy this time. In the desert. With like in the desert. craggy black spikes. And then we see and the that. the ground is falling behind him. Did you see that? Yeah. And then you see that black cloak figure who looks like a Dementor. And from Harry Potter, you're a wizard, Harry. Thank you, Hagrid. And I'll do it for you, buddy. You're a wizard, Harry. Thank you, Hagrid. So that, it kind of looked like a Dementor who had legs and who was a lantern. He has a lantern and he's calling him a little hero. But then he says, she is coming. And I thought it was very interesting that this, this spooky voice who shows up to Percy in what seems like nightmares is telling the truth. She is coming. And the she that he's talking about is a kidna, a- 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 right? Um, we wake up and we have the scene where the three heroes, they are in that train compartment. And then Grover does this funny thing. <laughs> you're, you, uh, he's, who's, you're Froofy. Here, he's Froofy. What's Froofy? <laughs> <laughs> so um, Annabeth and Percy, yeah. they'll have a little conversation before Grover wakes up hungry and, and crabby. Yeah, they froofy. talk about yeah. Thalia and they talk about how Thalia was tough. And how you had to earn her trust. Yes. And Percy asks Annabeth, is this why you're not very warm and accepting of me? And and Annabeth says kind of. So do we get to learn a little bit about Annabeth and why she is the way she is? Uh kinda. Of? Kind of. And and there's people in the world who do it's called guarded. Uh, if someone's like this, they're guarded because maybe they've been hurt in the past. Maybe they've been let down in the past and they're afraid to let people in because maybe they're afraid they're going to get hurt again. Maybe they're afraid they're going to lose that person. Or they're a monster in this case. Or they could be a monster. But remember how last episode I said my bad was Annabeth because I didn't feel like I was connecting with her. 
in this episode, we are starting to see other um, moments of her trying to connect with Percy. She talks about how it's not easy to talk to her mother and how now we see that her mother pretty much ignores her. So I really liked that Annabeth's character got to be a little bit more well-rounded and a little bit more friendly in this episode. She even says to Percy, watch out. Oh no, somewhere the Oracle's laughing because you're about to call me a friend. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that bit and that backstory about why Annabeth acts so so cold. Buddy, I, I got something to tell you though. I think both you and I are part Grover. No, if, I'm not. I am not a Grover. If we don't have snacks... If we if we are hungry, we are not the happiest person in the morning. Why is the St. Louis Arch such a big deal? Um, in this or real life? Um, both. Okay. It, and in then real life. In, the, in the show first, it is because one of her demigod ch- Athena's demigod children build it for her and Annabeth thinks it's just like perfect yep. precision, perfectly balanced, and I'm thinking. So, so it's this tall monument. You said it before a 630 feet tall monument in St. Louis, oh, it's Missouri. 630 feet tall. It's 630 feet wide, perfectly balanced against each other. It is the world's tallest arch, and it is the lo- tallest accessible structure in the entire state of Missouri. Um, some people are saying that it's the tallest human-made monument in the Western Hemisphere, so in the West. So it's a really giant thing. It actually started construction in 1963, and it opened to the public in 1965. So it's been around for a really, really long time, and you can go and explore it. And in addition to, like you were saying, Reese, Annabeth talking about how this is math and it is perfection and how important it is. It was built as a monument to westward expansion in the United States. So when when the settlers first came to the U.S., they really just focused on the eastern part. And then they had this big uh, journey out west. And what's been very interesting and and appropriate is that over time, they are paying homage. They They are showing that Westward expansion wasn't all sunshine and rainbows and roses, that actually a lot of people who already lived there, uh, the American Indians and the buffalo and all of the creatures and people who already lived in the West, a lot of them, the majority of them, were pushed out, were killed. And Grover sees that. So he he sees the pictures of the bison, you know, being hunted. He sees the pictures of the different tribes. Just because we're... Let's be, just just because we're prey doesn't mean we have to be helpless. Wow, Grover, I liked that quote. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like that showed he has a titch of brave in him, even though he's grumpy when he doesn't get food. There's still a titch of brave in him. He doesn't care. If he, he all he says, even though if we're prey, we still don't need to be scared. We can we can still stand up and fight for ourselves, like a bison in danger. And don't you think that that's true also for all three of these heroes? They're yeah. so much younger compared to Echidna who shows up. And she's saying, oh, I'm a mother. And none of your parents are helping you. But I'm going to help my baby. And that's a big thing that happens in this episode is we really focus on mothers. We have Sally Jackson. And then we have Echidna. And we also have Athena Not who being doesn't a good mother. show up. I liked how Percy was like, I'll be right down, just going to the potty. <laughs> You're pretending <laughs> to be here. And that brought, of course, oh a nice God, big God, smile God, to God. Annabeth. Um, so, yeah, I thought it was interesting that we really focused on the mothers. And that's why I wanted to play the clip in the beginning is that Echidna sees her children not being monsters, but that the demigods who kill her children are the monsters, that she likes to have peace and and clarity in the world but then her children get to do the yeah so to her she's the mother of these monsters she's the mother to the chimera does she want the does she want percy to win or the chimera to win obviously her kid exactly and i thought that that was a really neat perspective and sally jackson in the first episode reese was telling us not all things that look like monsters are monsters and not all things that look like heroes are heroes did echidna in this episode look Look like a monster. No, she looked like a normal person. Yep. Right? So it's really training us as the viewers, but also Percy Jackson and Annabeth and Grover, that not everything is what it seems. And what I also think we have to keep in mind is that things that are going to look like monsters 
that also means that we need to be careful and not to label them that they're that they're necessarily bad guys. Um, he Percy says we've sent monsters like you packing, and I thought that that was a funny thing because last episode he literally packaged up Medusa's head. Because <laughs> we've sent people like you packing is just a phrase that people say, like, "Oh, we've beaten people people up like you before. We've killed people, you know, monsters like you before." But truly, he did use packing materials in in this time. So I just thought that was a really interesting and neat thing. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about about this episode? Um, like, uh, how do myths tie with the episode, right? Yes. So, these myths are all... Was there any myths that you thought of in regards to this episode? The Bellerophon myth. Um, how he killed the Chimera. So, the Chimera, as we know in the myth, is just a goat body creature with a lion's head and a snake for a tail. Right? That right now is the other way around and mixed body parts. So, but I think that the Chimera... Is How was the chimera older. killed in that old fashion? The the previous, you the, know, the- he's and Bellerophon throws the spear down his throat as it begins to breathe fire. The lead melts in the chimera's throat and it dies. Interesting. So we're gonna have to see if the chimera dies in a similar way due to one of one of our heroes or maybe somebody else. All right, buddy. Well, guess what? One of the cool things that we do at Mary and Blake Media is we love to get listener feedback. So this means feedback from people all over the place, all over the United States, and all over the world. So if you want to leave your listener feedback, you can just by going to Mary and Blake. Dot com. Click the upper right-hand corner where it says contact us and you can leave a voicemail. You can also email us at maryandblakemedia at gmail.com. It is time to get into our listener feedback. First up, as usual, is in studio. We have little young Felicity. Felicity, welcome back. What's your GBG for this episode? My good is that... Percy survived a big fall that was 630 feet tall. Mm -hmm. And my bad is that the chimera tries to kill Percy and I wouldn't like to be killed. (laughs) I would not like to even be chased by the chimera. I agree. And how about your great? My great is that Annabeth and Grover get to safety because... I would like to get the safety more than I would rather be killed by the chimera. Did you find it? How would you describe Percy's behavior in that moment when he sacrifices himself and pushes Annabeth and Grover to safety? How would you Um, describe Percy? I would describe how it feels. It feels like that he is taking care of his friends more than himself Mm -hmm. of trying to save their lives so they can go save his mother. So selfless and maybe brave. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Well, thank you so much for, for popping on in time to listen to some more feedback. Now the first one I'm going to pull up is in regards to episode three. So the previous episode with Medusa. Hi, I'm Theo. I'm from Illinois and my GBG about the, about episode three was that um we get we get to see Medusa for the first time in the show. My bad was that the Furies are still chasing them, and my great was that um just like in the Greek myth, Percy cuts off Medusa's head. Yes, Theo from Illinois. Theo, you have inspired us. I was just saying this to Reese earlier today that we're going to get a map of the United States and then another world map. And we're going to start to mark off where we have callers in because Theo's calling in from Illinois and he is a fellow Greek myth fan. He enjoys that podcast that you were talking about as well, Reese. The Greeking Out would you agree with Theo that yeah. him cutting Greeking off Medusa's head? Yeah, Greeking Out is the best. <laughs> so if you want to listen to Greeking Out, just go to Apple Podcast and say, go to Greeking Out. Yes, yes. We, we we actually learned of the podcast thanks to Theo. So he also has fantastic knowledge of the Greek myths. Thanks so much for calling in, Theo. All right, here's our next voicemail. Hey, Mary and Reese. My name is Britta, and I live in the wonderful state of Minnesota. I've been listening to your podcasts for a long time. I think it is awesome, Reese, that you're reading and watching Percy ja- the Percy Jackson series in school. 
I am in my final year of student teaching, so very soon I will be an elementary teacher. Several years ago, the very first unit plan I wrote was on Greek myths because I had just read the Percy Jackson series. Cool. I can't wait to use it in the future, and this series would be a great addition. What I love about books getting, ad getting adapted into films and TV series is that it can get kids into reading and really excited about reading, which is particularly important for kids like Percy who find reading a challenge. What is one of your favorite films or TV shows that was adapted from a book? Or what book would you make from a film if you had the resources? Ooh. Thanks for all the fun and keep up the good work. Bye. Thank you so much, Britta. That is an excellent question. So Reese, as you heard, she's about to be a teacher, <laughs> which is so cool. I hope I wish you the best of luck, Britta. So her question to you, buddy, once again, if is there a movie or show that used to be a book that you really enjoy or is there a book that you wish would be a movie or show? I would wish to actually make a book, a book from a, sh a series I really like into another book. So I'm really into the Wings of Fire series. Mm. I bet when they deleted the show, I was like, no fair, no fair. Wings of Fire is a, is a dragon series book, right? Yeah, and I was supremely disappointed about that when I got canceled. But I'm thinking that I can try um, sending a message to the author about doing another one that I call it The Rise of the Storm. You never know. You know, you might be able to inspire the author to get another swing in. I do know that they tried to make it into a series, and like you said, whether it was, you know, just finances or timing or who knows, we can blame a lot of things on the pandemic at this point uh, that that series didn't get to be. So I hope one day that Wings of Fire does become a series for you. Here is our last voicemail for today. Hey, Mary Blake and Reese. This is Kendra from Nebraska. I am so excited to hear you guys podcasting about Percy Jackson. I think it's super important um, to have Reese's insights so that we don't forget amidst all the nostalgia for older fans of the book series that the target audience is children and we need to allow it to be what it is. There's not enough great television for kids out there right now. For my good, I'm going to go with the buildup of the chimera. Um, the slow pull of focus from Echidna to the ominous jostling and growling in the pet carrier was just a perfect building of tension. I'm elderly and it made me nervous, so I know that these creators are straddling that fine line with definite intent. For my bad, this was easy. I wish the episode had been longer. But even that is understandable. Given the age demographic, it's the perfect length of time for younger viewers. But for older viewers, the writing is so good that the shorter episodes feel a bit like an itch you can almost fully scratch before it moves out of your reach. For my great... It's the continuation of the subjectivity of monstrosity. The speech that Echidna gives about mothering and what you will do to protect your children hit very close to home. And this is also a theme that Steinberg and Schatz have explored in depth in Black Sails. The idea of freedom in the dark and that being a place of exploration, about the narrative being written by the hand that holds the biggest weapon. Introducing this narrative theme so early on, they actually got the ball rolling uh, last episode with Medusa is so important so that we can understand from the get go what's really important about the story they're telling. It sets clear expectations for the audience. The quiet way the actress delivers this while still building a tremendous amount of menace is akin to the way that Mr. Hyde is described in Robert Louis Stevenson's The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He's described not as monstrous, but as odd, which is far more unsettling in the realm of the uncanny valley in which this scene is firmly couched. Thanks so much for your enthusiasm, Reese, and I can't wait for the next episode. Thank you so much, yeah. Kendra. Oh, yay. So she had the same bad as you, that it felt a little short. <laughs> Good to know that your mind thinks alike with Kendra. Um, and like she was saying, this... This show is doing such a wonderful job making it entertaining for people my age, people older than me, people younger than me, and of course, your age, Reese, the people who probably can see themselves inside our heroes. So 
thank you to Kendra and Theo and to Britta and to everyone else who's been tuning in. Don't forget, we love playing your voicemail. So always feel free, maryandblake.com to send it your voicemail. I also want to give a shout out. We got another written review at Apple Podcasts. So wherever you listen to the podcast, whether it's YouTube or Spotify or Apple Podcasts, know that the best place to leave a written review, not just the clicking the five stars, but to write a sentence or two, is it Apple Podcasts just by searching The Percy Jackson Prophecy with Mary and Reese? Uh, and Reese, do you want to read this one? It was written by Maura. She said, excellent. Excellent. Another fantastic, fantastic podcast from Mary and Blake Media. I love listening to the insights and analysts of for Mary and her brilliant son, Reese. Reese has an incredible knowledge of Greek mythology. This is a kid-friendly podcast that adults will enjoy as well. Looking forward to hearing more. Thank you so much, Maura. We really appreciate it. And on that note, my friend, it's time for the mere mortal theory of the week. Okay, so me being the mere mortal. And I'm half blood. It means that I have not read the book series. So my, um, my idea behind this is that... We are going to meet Poseidon really soon. And Maybe even in the next episode, just because that water spirit, is it called a naiad? That's what it is? Nereid. Nereid. Um, was telling him, you know, your dad's been here all along. We're all rooting for you. We all care about you. So I'm hoping that... While Percy is still in the water, maybe his dad will come see him. That's my mere more theory of the week is that we're going to meet Poseidon next week. Who knows if I'm right? Who knows if I'm wrong? But that's what I am going for. All right. It is time to close out the show. Well, friends, thank you for tuning in to this yet another episode of the Percy Jackson Prophecy. Reese and I are delighted that you are having fun delving into this series on Disney Plus with us. Don't forget, sharing is caring. If you are a person who enjoys the series and you know other friends who like the Rick Riordan series, please let them know about this podcast. If you haven't had a moment yet to submit your voicemail or your feedback, know that we're always here. We love connecting with you. That's what makes all of this um, even better, even better for us. Well, until next time, Half-Bloods, I'm Mary Larson. My name is Reese. And remember, hold fast in brave storm. That's right. 